Thank you for coming to this important meeting. This matter is urgent and we need your help as suffragists and former abolitionists and we only have a few weeks to take action. As an officer of the National Women's Suffrage Association along with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, our leaders. We feel it is imperative that the 15th Amendment only be ratified if it allows all citizens to vote, women and freedmen and women. The 15th Amendment reads, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color or previous condition of servitude. However, as you are certainly and most painfully aware, women are not considered citizens. We are still considered property, like cattle or horses, or yes, even slaves, property to be bought and sold and treated as the owner sees fit. Just five years ago, in 1865, the 13th Amendment freed all slaves and outlawed any new state from joining the Union as a slave state. And yet women are still not considered free and equal citizens. I am here today to appeal to you to sign this petition demanding that the 15th Amendment clearly include women in its decree. My dear friend, Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe, asked that I come especially talk, to talk to your chapter of suffragists because she knew of your past support of our abolitionist work. I thank you for your kind welcome. Your host has shared with me that some of you have read my book. Now I will address what some might consider my infamy. I prefer to call it my expertise. <laughs> I wrote this book. I am Maddie Griffith, Mrs. Maddie Griffith Brown, and I wrote Autobiography of a Female Slave in 1857. Not to try to hoodwink people into thinking that I was a former slave, no. I wrote this book to try to raise the money to free the slaves I inherited from my parents. Yes, I know what it means from birth to own another human being. I know what it means to see men and women, no different from me, save circumstance, accident, and condition, cast my life among them, to see men and women bought and sold and, and, and treated worse than animals. I knew what was wrong from my earliest childhood memories, and I did everything in my power to free the slaves I inherited from my parents. I am from the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and I love its beautiful landscapes and its people, with the exception of its embrace of slavery. And although Kentucky law did not expressly bar freed slaves from residing in the state, I feared that when I freed these men and women, rogue slave traders would capture them and sell them back into slavery. Well, to prevent this, I needed to purchase manumission bonds to free them and to provide them with the means to start new lives in a free state. Several of my friends and colleagues, acquainted with my cause, aided me in raising the funds I needed to purchase six manumission bonds. With these funds and those raised from the sale of my book, I was able to return to Kentucky one year after having published Autobiography of a Female Slave. That October in 1858 would test my faith in many of my fellow Kentuckians. 
Upon returning to Owensboro, I was quite retired. I did not see many people. Those whom I did see were coldly polite to me. My family, those whom I saw, were civil, but said that I would soon live to regret what I had done, that it was rash and ill-advised, but as I made my path, so must I walk. My uncle said that it was commendable that I practiced what I preached, but let me tell you, they did not like to see me in the kitchen. They appeared to look upon me as a dangerous person. Well, this was mortifying. Some of my friends refused to see me. I met frost with ice. I sent for the servants, Henderson, Mariah, Sally, Harrison, Ann, and Henry Brady, and told them of my intention. I explained the laws as simply as I could and told them that it would be necessary for them to leave the state as soon as they were free. They listened with emotion and then earnestly inquired whether there was any way of evading the law so that they might remain upon native soil among old home influences. I told them of the inevitable dangers of staying or of returning upon any pretext whatsoever. Once they were made to understand this and the hard conditions, they said with an eloquent sigh, all places are alike to the Negro. It was a blissful moment for me when I placed the deeds of manumission in their hands. They seemed to undergo some, uh, some uh, heavenly transfiguration. Their, their faces and their bodies appeared to glow. What? Are we going to be free to belong to ourselves? Oh, it seems like a dream. <laughs> well, they laughed, they danced, they sang, they wept. Indeed, I thought Henderson was crazy. He was so bewildered with joy. <laughs> it, was a, it was a blissful moment for me when I, when I placed the deeds of manumission in their hands. I never expect to experience such a thrill of happiness again. Poor creatures. They embraced my knees. They kissed my hands. They, they would have covered my very feet with caresses if I would have permitted it. They called me by every exalted name in the English language. But when these first ebullitions of feeling were over, they began to think more about me than of themselves. They came back to me with downcast looks and said, but Miss Maddie, you can't afford to do this. You will have to work. Take us back, Miss Maddie. We are all willing to keep on working for you. And wasn't this very touching? I can never be forgetful of my duty to their race. Some of my friends praised me for my actions, but I merely did my duty. What I was obliged by every consideration, human and divine, to do, and I uh, I wish that it would be speedily forgotten and nothing more said of it. I felt that it was a private affair and should be kept where all private matters should be, in silence. But my friends impressed upon me the example that I could set for other slaveholders who wished to be free of such a barbaric practice in our country. For that purpose, I began to share my story over the past several years, as I'm doing here today. When I am given the opportunity to share my story with other women, women who understand the need to be recognized for the work that we do in our homes and for our family and for our friends, it is with a, well, with a deep sense of humility that, and yes, even shame, that I describe my upbringing in Kentucky. As a young girl growing up, I was afforded every privilege one could ever wish for a child. I was born into a family of slaveholders on a plantation in Owensboro, Kentucky, right along the Ohio River, just southwest of Louisville. 
As I mentioned, my sister and I lost both our parents when we were very young. And we inherited the slaves our family owned. Six human beings were deeded to me as if they were books or, or chairs or horses. I was, I was too young to fully comprehend the complete outrage this practice deserved, but I did know from the time I was five years old that owning another human being was wrong. And I did everything in my power to free the slaves I inherited from my parents. As I mentioned, my, my sister Catherine, well, she married a, a Dr. Slattery, an Irish Catholic physician who married her for her beauty and her wealth. But with brutal neglect of her all the while, sold off all her property consisting solely of Negroes. And when I would not yield to him my Negroes to be sold, which I would not do because I felt obliged to set them free, threw Catherine and her three children upon me, just as I was coming north in the hopes of gaining a means of subsistence for myself. So instead of an earning an income for myself only, I found I needed to earn it for five persons and then learned that I needed to hire and support a nurse to care for my sister's younger child. Catherine and I had become too outraged about slavery to tolerate living on a plantation or in a slave state any longer. So Catherine, her three children, and I moved to Philadelphia to live with our aunt. We eventually found our own apartment on Cherry Street. We were unprepared for the poverty of mind, body, and spirit we endured. We had lived such pampered lives in Kentucky due to the toil, sweat, and blood of the slaves our family owned. I, I don't remember a great deal of the time when, when my parents were alive. I do know that my father and my uncles were in the brewery business and that my father owned a tavern and he left enough money that my uncles who took turn caring for us afforded Catherine and me many luxuries. We had bonnets made of seal fur, new shoes for every season. Our hats and clothes and coats were made from the finest cloth and notions you could find in Louisville. And we traveled frequently in a hack to Louisville to purchase books and fabric and other luxuries. We were educated in Owensboro and in Louisville. We went to St. Vincent's School and uh, Davies County Seminary, and that was run by George Scarborough. Now, I see some of you recognize that name. George's sister, Olive Gilbert, also taught in Owensboro. Olive Gilbert was Sojourner Truth's amanuensis for her book, Narrative of Sojourner Truth. Oh yes, George Scarborough and Olive Gilbert were well-known abolitionists and they were dedicated teachers. They eventually opened the Scarborough Academy. Now, you have to understand <laughs> that my family taught me to regard abolitionists from the North as wolves in sheep's clothing, as violent bad men who decoyed slaves from their homes with false promises. I think one of the reasons George and Olive chose to live and teach in Owensboro, in the heart of slave country, was the hope of finding students like Catherine and me, whom they could gently influence to stand against slavery. And they were excellent teachers, for as a young woman, I became a journalist for the Louisville Journal. Now, the Louisville Journal also published some of my articles and stories and poems, which led to the publication of my first book in 1852, Poems. If you will indulge me, I should like to read you a portion from one of my favorite poems. It reminds me sharply of my mother and my sister and our beautiful home in Kentucky.
I'm musing now, my sister, on the time when we in our own dear, our native clime, with our dear mother in our childhood dwelt, gay as the singing birds, and never felt the care, the grief, the agony, the strife, that lurk like fiends along the paths of life. There around our home, the rose of crimson dye bared its young heart of beauty to the eye. There sprang the violets and the lilies there. Pale nuns of nature bowed their heads in prayer. The jasmine, sweetest of the race of flowers, breathed its full solar fragrance in the bowers. Above the window of our little room, the honeysuckle hung in clustering bloom. Before our door, the bright blue streamlet played, leaping and dimpling in the light and shade. And the tall trees of deep and solemn green upon the far horizon seemed to lean like holy watches of the golden sky, the sentinels of immortality. How I do miss Kentucky at times. In Philadelphia, Catherine and her children and I were very poor and we were frequently quite ill. While caring for Catherine and her children, I began to read the National Anti-Slavery Standard and the writings of other abolitionists, William Lloyd Garrison, Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, Lydia Maria Child, and Senator Charles Sumner. Senator Sumner inspired me with his passionate demand for a slave-free Kansas with his speech, Crimes Against Kansas. Oh, he was a radical Republican. I recall with righteous amusement his comments about Senator Andrew Butler who supported slavery. Oh. The senator from South Carolina has read many books of chivalry and believes himself a chivalrous knight with sentiments of honor and courage. Of course, he has chosen a mistress to whom he has made his vows and who, though ugly to others, is always lovely to him. <laughs> though polluted in the sight of the world, is always chaste in his sight. I mean the harlot slavery. I was outraged that other leaders in our country would so disagree with Senator Sumner that they would resort to violence within the very walls of the United States Senate. South Carolina Congressman Preston Brooks actually struck Senator Sumner with a cane in the Senate chambers two days after his speech. He beat Senator Sumner into unconsciousness. Having grown up surrounded by the horrors of slavery, Senator Sumner's words helped solidify my belief that all slaves must be manumitted immediately and that no new states be allowed to join the Union as slave states. I wrote to my friends, Anne and Carolyn Weston, that I was only too ready to serve the anti-slavery cause in any manner, no matter how humble or how great, simply use me. <laughs> oh, I wanted to do something of more signal than prating. This I knew I owed to the slaves, for through my very blood, unconscious it is true, I had helped to wrong them. God knows I was anxious in my own person to, to provide any means of restitution, that, that I, I wished I had a wider range of influence and deeper and broader powers, that through me, the three millions might find a medium of desperate and earnest complaint. This, this was the beginning of my life's work, to seek to manumit not only my slaves, but all slaves in our country. Now, Women, <clears throat> white women, we know what freedom does and does not mean. We know it is not enough to be simply free in this country. One must have the right to vote. One must have the right to choose one's own representation in our government. And so I also seek to seek to establish the right to vote for all men and women, white and Negro, in our country. 
To this purpose, I began to write articles for newspapers and stories which the standard serialized. You might have read some of my stories, Ratey, the story of a little hunchback, and Madge Vertner. Madge Vertner is a story of a young woman who thinks that um, she is white. She is the daughter of a plantation owner. And it is not until his death that she discovers that she is the daughter of a slave and her white father, that she is a mulatto. Yes, I wrote about the things that I saw growing up in Kentucky. I was encouraged to write in this vein by those around me, including Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe. Mrs. Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, came out in 1852, the same year as my book, Poems. I want to share with you a little known fact about Mrs. Stowe's book. Now, Mrs. Stowe met and interviewed Josiah Henson after his escape from Kentucky to Canada. He was a runaway slave and she interviewed him and based her book on his life story. Josiah Henson was a slave from Owensboro, Kentucky, my hometown. Now, I cannot claim to have known Mr. Henson or his owners, but it is likely that they knew my parents and aunts and uncles. It is connections such as this that continue to impress upon me the need to seek support and help to obtain true freedom and the right to vote for all in our country. If you will indulge me one more time, I should like to read to you from my book, Autobiography of a Female Slave. The main character, as some of you may know, is Anne. I created Anne because, like Mrs. Stowe, I thought that, um, that a young, light-skinned woman who was taught to read and treated kindly by her first masters would allow my readers to seek to know more about her and seek to know more about her life as a slave. And yes, what I wrote in this book is based on my life growing up on that plantation in Owensboro and what I witnessed of the slave trade in Louisville. <clears throat> The first lick from Mr. Peterkin laid my back open. I writhed, I wrestled, but blow after blow descended, each harder than the preceding one. I shrieked, I screamed, I pleaded, I prayed, but there was no mercy shown me. Mr. Peterkin, having fully gratified and quenched his spleen, turned to Mr. Jones and said, now is your turn. You can beat her as much as you please, only just leave a bit of a life in her, is all I cares for. Yes, I'll not spoil her for the market, but I does want to take a little of the damn pride out of her. Now boys, for by this time, all the slaves on that place, save Aunt Polly, had assembled round the post. You will see what a true stroke I can make, but darn my buttons if I doesn't think Mr. Peterkin has drawn all the blood. So saying, Jones drew back the cowhide at arm's length and making a few evolutions with his body, took what he called sure aim. I closed my eyes in terror more from the terrible pain than from the frantic shoutings of the crowd, I knew that Mr. Jones had given me a lick that he called true blue. The exultation of the Negroes in Master Jones' triumph was scarcely audible to my ears, for a cold, clammy sensation was stealing over my frame. My breath was growing feebler and feebler, and a soft melody as of lulling summer fountains was gently sounding in my ears as if gliding away on a moonbeam. I passed from all consciousness. A sweet oblivion like that sleep which announces to the wearied, fever-sick patient that his hour of rest has come fell upon me. It was not dreamful sensibility filled with a chaos of fragmentary visions, but a rest where the mind, nay, the very soul, seemed to sleep with the body. 
How long the stupor lasted, I am unable to say. But when I awoke, I was lying on a rough bed, a face dark, haggard, scarred and worn, was bending over me. Disfigured as was that visage, it was pleasant to me, for it was human. I opened my eyes, then closed them languidly, reopened them, then closed them again. Now, child, I think you is a little better, said the dark-faced woman, whom I recognized as Aunt Polly. But I was too weak, too wandering in mind to talk, and I closed my eyes and slept again. Anne is, is then so um, given to the oldest daughter of that family as part of that girl's dowry and then travels with her new mistress and master to live in Louisville. Now, Louisville is a major port on the Ohio River. Much of Kentucky's slave trade, exchange of bodies, people for money, occurred in Louisville. You, you cannot imagine the, the sounds and the smells and the chaos created by the slave owners and the slave traders. If you were a slave and you found yourself in the garrison slave pens at the corner of 2nd and Market Street, just a block from the Ohio River, you knew your life was over as you'd previously known it because you were being sold down the river. Mrs. Stowe shares such profoundly painful details about life in the Deep South that it, it shakes your very soul. And she shares a sentiment which I cannot say I disagree with, but I find it repugnant to say this out loud. Being a slave in Kentucky was a far better fate than being a slave in Alabama or Georgia or Mississippi. In fact, Kentucky never outlawed teaching a slave to read or write, never prohibited owners from freeing their slaves, and never actually forced freed slaves to leave the state. Negroes had heard enough horror stories about life in the Deep South that if they found themselves being auctioned to the highest bidder in Louisville, well, they rightly feared for their lives. I, I want to share with you two reviews of my book, not to sing my praises, but to share with you the, the differing opinions it received. Yeah. Hinton Rowan Helper wrote that my book was a work of fiction which is fuller of fact than any book of the kind that we have ever read. A work which for vivid, accurate delineation of indoor life in the South and for terse graphic portrayal of slaveholding manners has no equal. High praise. Now, the Louisville Journal, for whom I'd written several years before, suggested that I had gone farther than even Mrs. Stowe in describing the slavery system of the South. The Louisville Journal wrote that the autobiography of a female slave just published by Redfield shows that there is yet a deeper depth of anti-slavery fiction to which the authoress of Uncle Tom's Cabin had not yet attained and that it is possible to produce an anti-slavery novel of infinitely greater merit as a literary production and a vastly deeper infamy as a total misrepresentation of African slavery in the South than anything that has yet been published. Considered merely as a literary production, independent of its gross misrepresentations, false theories and most disgusting ultra anti-slavery aspirations, it evinces a high order of talent and literary genius. <laughs> Gross misrepresentations indeed. I'll ha Everything I wrote in that book was based on what I experienced growing up in Kentucky. I'll have you know that I was at two several times presented to the grand jury of Kentucky for violating the laws of that state regarding the privileges given to my Negroes. I was taken to court because I was too kind to my slaves. Can you imagine? 
I can show you the receipts for the care given to Mariah at the birth of her son John, and then four years later at the birth of her daughter Salina. Receipts from the doctor and the midwife when my Negroes were ill or the women needed obstetric care. I paid for the room and board when their children died at birth. I purchased the quinine to treat them for malaria. I treated them with the respect they deserved and all that I was able to do under the circumstances. I trust you now have a, a better understanding of why I chose to pen my book to free these slaves. And yet, I must confess that I felt a, an acute pain to be supported pecuniarily to do my duty as an anti-slavery agent to support my family. Yet, when Elizabeth Palmer Peabody suggested that I had no right to refuse employment, when the alternative was to receive my income from my slaves, well, I yielded to the opportunity to do an indefinite amount of good to the anti-slavery cause by using my pen. Mrs. Peabody, well, she did an immense kindness to my sister and me that I shall never be able to repay. Elizabeth wrote to her friends, Mrs. Frances Adeline Seward, Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe, and others, seeking to establish a subscription of 20 ladies and gentlemen who should each pay $50 a piece to me for the ensuing year as a salary to write my tales or whatever else I decided to write. In this way, I was able to support myself and my family for a year, go to Kentucky in October of 1858, as we planned, and free the slaves under my care and, and I also received a $100 grant from William Lloyd Garrison's American Anti-Slavery Society to help free these slaves. Having successfully manumitted Henderson, Mariah, Sally, Harrison, Ann, and Henry Brady, I turned my attention to other abolitionist causes. John Brown's raid upon Harper's Ferry bolstered our efforts mightily to rid our nation of slavery. Oh, poor John Brown. <laughs> the thought of him never left me. I, during the first week after his capture in 1859, I did not close my eyes. And though the weather was very cool, I had to, I had to put out my fire and, and open my windows. I felt stifled with a great effort to keep quiet. I couldn't think, but they would dare to hang him. But, but what an argument he provided the abolitionist cause and his death, as indeed it did come, surely advanced the movement half a century. But what a martyrdom it was. That scaffold was as glorious as the cross of Calvary. Those northerners were cowards for not protesting the hurried nature of John Brown's trial. I felt like going out and preaching a crusade, like Peter the Hermit. <laughs> So, when I moved to New York City to write for the American Anti-Slavery Standard, I became an officer of the American Equal Rights Association and the Women's Loyal National League, which was run by Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucy Stone. They are such important women to our cause, so very brave and diligent. As one of the original committee members, I helped craft a petition which we sent to Congress for the first time in May of 1863. Oh, yeah. The Senate and House of Representatives of the United States, the undersigned women of the United States, earnestly pray that your honorable body will pass at the earliest practicable day an act emancipating all persons of African descent held to involuntary service or labor in the United States. Senator Sumner himself credited the Women's Loyal National League as the principal force behind the drive and eventual passage of the 13th Amendment. Two months after we sent this petition to Congress, I witnessed a most terrifying event. 
I was living in New York City and writing for the uh, American anti-slavery standard and living in the same building as the American Freedmen's Commission office. I was there in July of 1863, six months after the, proclamation, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation was signed. It was during what they now call the Civil War draft riots, which disgraced that city of the free North. You will no doubt have read accounts of it. For four long, bloody days, that entire CD was under the rule of the most boisterous, noisy, riotous, murderous mob that ever disgraced barbaric, let alone civilized times. The federal government had entered all eligible men into a lottery for military duty. Freed men, freed slaves, were not considered citizens yet and could not vote nor own property, and as such were ineligible for the draft. White men who could hire a substitute or pay the government $300 might avoid conscription. The Democratic Party was still so favorable towards slavery inflame the people of New York. Just a few days after the lottery started, riots began breaking out right underneath the windows of our office. The conscription was made the pretext, but it was truly the outbreak of the sympathizers with the Southern Rebellion. That I live to tell you this tale is a marvel, for they threatened to burn our house because the American Freedmen's Commission office was under our roof, and we lived under momentary expectation of an attack. I can scarcely describe to you my feelings. They were not feelings, more a sense of half being. I wrote a letter to my friend, Mary Ann Eslin of England, describing the riots. I think it is important that you understand exactly what happened during those four days. We had no police in the streets. They had all been detailed to the more immediate scenes of violence. Murder and arson stalked abroad. Men entered houses and demanded money from ladies at the point of the bayonet. The mob burnt any house they fancied. One telegraphic wire was destroyed. Railway tracks torn up. The fire engines not allowed to work. Plunder and murder went on by the wholesale. Through the bowed blinds of my windows, I watched the strange, wretched, abandoned creatures that flocked out from their dens and lairs. They stood under my window, defied the government, cursed the draft, and used all sorts of wicked language. I was heart sick. The Negroes, the poor Negroes, they were the worst sufferers. No one helped them. They were recklessly shot down, hanged, burned, and roasted alive. Every device and refinement of cruelty practiced upon them, and no one dared intervene on their behalf. God knows my heart bleeds when I, when I attempt to recount the atrocities to which in their friendless, helpless condition they were forced to submit. Uh, a child of three years of age was thrown from a four-story window and instantly killed. A woman, one hour after her confinement, was set upon and beaten with her tender babe in her arms and driven in peril of her life to the woods where she remained during a pelting storm and was found dead next morning. Children were torn from their mother's embrace and their brains blown out in the very face of the afflicted mothers. Men, men were burnt by slow fires, mutilated, 
arms, limbs cut off, and they forced to meet death in this slow manner. All sorts of barbarities were practiced for four long, bloody days, each one of us silently awaiting our own call. You see, our copperhead governor, Horatio Seymour, had most artfully denuded the city of the military by ordering off the regiments to Pennsylvania under pretext of whipping the rebel invaders of that state. Ew, it makes my heart boil to think of such outrages. It appears I may have upset some of you with my description of the riots. For that, I do apologize. As, as horrific as those four days were, I must needs remind myself that such ho horrible days are far behind us now. Perhaps I should share with you a more pleasant aspect of my life and one that might inspire our younger women who may be concerned that fighting for the right to vote may prevent them from marrying. <laughs> I thought I should never marry, much less find a mate who shared my beliefs or supported my efforts to bring those beliefs to light. I thought I should live out life on the women's rights plan, single and alone. <laughs> But when I met Mr. Albert Gallatin Brown, Jr. in 1866, I surprised myself, my family, and my friends when I married him. Oh, he is an abolitionist, and he supports the suffragist movement, who is very anti-slavery, and he was uh, military secretary for Massachusetts Governor John A. Andrew. Furthermore, he promised to leave me very free in all matters of thought and action. I think he has helped me to be an even stronger advocate for voting rights in our country, which brings me back to the very reason I'm here before you today. Since the 13th Amendment was passed in 1865, we have been free from the tyranny of slavery in our country. No new states have joined the Union as slave states. We are not, however, free from the continued prejudice, bigotry, and hatred so often expressed against these freedmen and women. Nor are we free to express our opinion in the ballot box. We, women, white women, and freedmen and women still do not have the right to vote. It is women such as Harriet Beecher Stowe, Lydia Maria Child, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucy Stone, and men like William Lloyd Garrison, Ralph Waldo Emerson, John Brown, Senator Charles Sumner, and my husband, Albert Gallatin Brown, Jr., and men and women like you who continue to work for a world free of slavery, a world in which we are free to vote our conscience we are striving for these very things right now. We long for a world in which we are free to vote, free to earn our own money, free to own property. The only way to power in our government is through this one sacred constitutional right of petition. And I urge you to use it now to the utmost. As one of 12 vice presidents of the National Woman Suffrage Association, I urge you to sign this petition, to write letters, to pass out flyers, to volunteer your time, to work with us in our struggle to obtain true freedom and the right to vote for all in our country. I thank you for your time today. As an act of thanking the League of Women Voters, I want to give them a gift from Maddie Griffith and myself. Um, however, I am tethered and cannot reach it. <laughs> <laughs> so I would ask someone else to um, reach my gift over there. Um, I like to give a copy of the book, Autobiography of a Female Slave, and the edition of it that is out there uh, available with an afterword by Professor Joe Lockard. 
This is the edition of the book that I first pur purchased when I was reading about Matty Griffith and was fascinated by the book as well as his afterward. Really opened up my eyes to a world that I had not much knowledge of and did not know there were such women in Kentucky. So I would like to present this to the chapter of the League of Women Voters, both here in St. Joseph, <laughs> Berrien County, County, and Pass County, and Cass, Cass County, Cass County um, in Three Oaks. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so, how long did Maddie live, and how, where was she in the fight to put women on the Fifteenth Amendment, and the um, the controversy that erupted within the women's movement to do that? Uh, Maddie lived until 1906, and she died of complications of breast cancer. It's been killing us for too many years, women. Um, sorry. Um, she was a part of the group that wanted all men and women to have the right to vote. And this was the beginning of the schism to say, well, we've got to get men, African-American men, we've got to get freed men the right to vote. They'll only give it to men, so we can at least get them on the ballot. And I think there was a, a time when she said, okay, that's, that's, she was part of the group that said, okay, that's practical. Um, I think, um, you may correct me if I'm wrong. I think Frederick Douglass, you know, helped push that side. But after that, she was very much part of the camp that said, then white women and freed women must have the right to vote. We cannot separate them. We separated before, we can't do that again. And then that's when we wound up with the two different women's rights groups. Um, and and they really were quite contentious against each other um, for quite some time. And then in 1920, the white women got the right to vote. Um, freed women did not. And, 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 you know, and that really has set our country back a lot because of that. Um, does that answer your question? The okay. right of citizens mm -hmm. of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So I think in general, that granted all um, slaves, or all black people, people of any race, theoretically at least, the right to vote. The 19th Amendment did essentially the same thing in essentially the same language with respect to women. So that reads, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex, okay? There had been many states before this that had granted women the right to vote, and the Constitution left to the states until this amendment, the uh, regulation of voting, okay? So technically, all people of all races got to write the right to vote with the 15th Amendment, but it, it, that was only on account of race. The account of sex came through the 19th Amendment. So when we talk about the Voting Rights Act of 1965, that's not the textual distinction, that's the practical distinction when all the suppression was brought to light in something was done or attempted to be done on the suppression of the vote of people who were other than Caucasian. Mm -hmm. And particularly in some states, particularly in the South, where the states, through their powers that were left to them by the Constitution, employed those powers to suppress those votes. So forgive me for my lawyerliness. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> Women have been fighting for equality and for an understanding of our equal status. 
I don't know, s since Adam and Eve. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we've been f struggling for this. And so um, in the, so that, that wave of suffragists or suffragettes in the 19 teens and 1920, uh, you know, leading up to 1920, there was a lot of suppression, a lot of violence, a lot of, um, anger and frustration towards them. Afterwards, I'm sure it was not easy to show up at the polling place and vote. I'm sure there was still a lot, but, but that's a part of the, the life of our, our country that I have not done a lot of research in. Um, yeah, and you know, yes, thank you. <laughs> I should. Thank you. Thank you.